Going is still full. There, um, everything sounding great. I turned it up a little bit on the game's laptop. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of initial technical difficulty. Uh, session, but, uh, You were just saying that my name is Dave. Yes. Does anybody know how Jesse's brother did in the Iron Man? Thank you. 
I was on the floor telling one another that I was on the floor. Don't forget to like the Hey, question. It'll be it'll be at the beginning of the experience is when we'll open the um gotta show preparing. So it'll be you, Ned, and then the public. Then you'll have your opportunity to respond. Council will ask questions, then we'll close the public hearing for deliberation. So right after item six. It's good. Okay. 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 Road bike or mountain bike? So, um, <laughs> all right, do this. I was a little bit of a different hybrid test. I gave up on my mountain bike and everything over the handlebars, struck my helmet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 straight on my head at age 60. Yeah. All right, it is Tuesday, June 25th, 2024. The time is 7 o'clock p.m. I call this meeting of the Dillon Town Council to order. Roll call. Council Member Woods? Here. Council Member Pine? Here. Council Member Luck? Here. Council Member Imamura? Here. Council Member Hendricks? Here. Council Member Christensen? Here. Madame Scavera? Here. Up next is approval of the agenda. We'll be reading through the agenda uh, as it's written here tonight. Next item is approval of the consent agenda, the minutes of regular meeting of June 11, 2024, approval of bill list dated June 18, 2024, and payroll ledger dated June 14, 2024, consideration of resolution number 3124, series of 2024, resolution by the town of <coughs> town council, the town of Dillon, Colorado, approving a memorandum of understanding with the Frisco Police Department for joint usage and pur purchase of the Lenko Bearcat. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Council Member Woods? Yes. Council Member Time? Yes. Council Member Luck? Yes. Council Member Mamera? Yes. Council Member Hendricks? Yes. Council Member Christensen? Yes. Madam Silvera? Yes. Up next is citizen citizens are asked to limit their comments to five minutes. Council will take comments into consideration, but will not make decisions at this time. Council will not engage in back and forth dialogue, but may respond to a speaker with brief factual information or refer the speaker, the town manager to arrange a meeting with an appropriate staff member for a discussion of the speaker's topic at an appropriate time. 
the council has no obligation to engage with the speaker by either of the foregoing methods or at all. I'd like to point out to those in attendance here today that there will be a public hearing on both items six and seven. So if you're here to make a comment on either item six or seven, you can make it then. Um, otherwise, I'll accept general public comment at this time. I have several people signed up, so I'll go down the list. And then if you're not signed up and you do want to make a public comment, please feel free to let, let me know. Uh, Joel Schwartzman. If you would, come on up to the podium, state your name and address for the record, and then I'll start your five-minute timer. I am Joel Schwartzman. I uh, live at the Lodge of Lake Dillon. I have a few comments, some of which are really suggestions to the council. I looked at this agenda when I walked in, and I said to myself, if you want to play keep away, this is probably the best way I've ever seen of doing it. I have no idea what six has to do with and what the ordinances involved are. I used to get emails from the council. I used to get these agendas via email. I don't know what happened to those, but I have a suggestion for you. Do you have any number of voting people, residents in the, in the town of Dillon? Assign somebody to collect their emails and send out regular minutes. Part of what came forward this last weekend was the fact that there are an awful lot of people in this town that are very confused about what's going on in this council. And there are even more who are not informed. And it seems to me that focus groups, which were mentioned, I don't know when they happened. And I used to try to chime in on the minutes but I don't do that much anymore because I'm busy doing other things. Believe it or not, there are other things than what the Dillon Town Council involves itself in. But you are going to get a lot of feedback from the residents. And part of the reason is because they don't feel included in what you're doing. I certainly don't. I'd like you to look at what's in front of you. Those are microphones. I have come to these meetings any number of times. I cannot hear you. I just simply can't hear you. I'm not deaf, although my wife thinks I am. I can't understand what's on those screens because I can't see them. And I've got trifocals. My eyes are pretty good. But I don't understand what's on that screen, and I don't know where you are most of the time. Take a look at what's on the agenda. If you want to talk about keep away, I mean, I was a, a colonel in the United States Air Force. My thing was logistics. I was a chaplain, and I got to A, and I got to B to C and D, and I got there pretty easily, but not everybody thinks from A to B to C to D. Some people think from A to M and back to C, and it's difficult for them. For me, I don't know what you're talking about, especially when you use mnemonics. I asked somebody just before I stood up here to talk what JGJP was. I have seen those letters before, but I didn't understand what they meant. Spell it out. Include us. Bring us in on what you're doing. You'll have a heck of a lot easier time to get stuff done, and you'll have the people of Dillon on your side. But first of all, I don't know how much time it would take to gather our email addresses and to talk to us electronically about what it is you're doing, because the alternative is revolt. We would happily take your email address, and townofdillon.com is where you can get re-signed up. I don't know how you got dropped off our list. It's I don't know either. But highly unusual that we would lose an email. I'll pass you my email address. I have it on here, right here, so I'll make Good. a note that we'll add you to the list. Thanks. I appreciate it. Eddie O'Brien. Uh, I'm Eddie O'Brien, 18 Spinning Leaf Trail, Silverthorne, 
and I own three people, or I'm sorry, I don't own any people, but I do have, I do have property. So uh, next door, 325 Lake Dillon Drive. Uh, I have a portion of the property on uh, uh, where the Meridian building is, and then we own the old medical building at uh, 125 or 105 Main Street, which is a building that nobody can see because it's covered in trees. So, uh, yeah, I have, I do care about what's going on here in the town. And uh, I do have also experience with three different towns in economic development, including Silverthorne, Steamboat, and Dillon. So the first thing I wanna say is, uh, let's talk about the hotel. <clears throat> All of the EDACs that I've worked on, they wanted one thing, and that was to have a barbell-like hotel with the uh, main street in the center. So the barbell was a hotel on either side. So right now we have one at the top of the hill, and we'd like to have another one that's on the lake. Not quite on the lake, but on Lake Dillon Drive, which this one is. Uh, the other thing that is interesting to me is... I like the ownership of it because what the ownership does, if, as you own one of these units, you're committing to those units being rented most of the year. What does that mean? That brings people onto your main street. And most economic development is about one thing in the mountains, and that's either building, recreating, or strengthening the main streets. So three good examples, silver, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Salida, BV, and Leadville. Go look at those, see what's going on. And you're gonna see what can happen with proper um, input on bringing people onto the main streets. That's really important. That hotel is gonna fit in with the hotel above us. Uh, on one of the things that I would really like to see because the town is poor. <laughs> The town doesn't make anywhere near the money it should uh, carrying retail sales taxes. Uh, I don't know what the your property taxes are, but I think the normal property tax that you're that the town of Dillon is getting will buy one or two tanks of gas for your pickup truck. That's it. So what needs to happen is you need to increase the value, or I'm sorry, increase your income. I want you to put a 1% transfer tax on everything that is either being built and make that negotiation with a developer or and also probably put it on a referendum. That 1% is huge. I want you to look at Breckenridge. I want you to look at Silverthorne. And I want you to look at Frisco. And you'll look at the numbers that that 1% brings in. And that 1% will occur every time that property is sold. And 1% to the developer is nothing, and it means very little to anyone else. But wait till you see what the dollars come in. Then the other one, uh, I think, I want local business people who live here owning the businesses. I was just in Crested Butte. It's fabulous. Why? The owners were in their stores or in their restaurants. I really don't want commercial long-term ownership of property from New York, New Jersey, wherever the heck it is. I really don't want it. I want local people who you see in the morning at breakfast going to, their sh going to work in their place in Dillon, which it used to have. That's all disappeared. I also want more thoughtful use of the Denver, uh, of the uh, Dillon Urban Renewal Authority. Quit fooling around, make it work for the core area. Because right off the bat, what are you gonna get in? You're gonna become one of the local centers of Summit County. And events, where are our events? Our events have disappeared during the summer and our events have disappeared during the winter. And if we don't start getting that stuff back together, you're gonna watch this town get even lower than it is right now. Right now, this town is in a position that every developer on the earth would like to be in. It's on the floor. It's the perfect time to come in and do a thoughtful redevelopment of this town. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Up next we have Bobby Craig. <clears throat> 
If you would state your name and address for the record, and I'll start your five minute timer. Bobby Craig, 1037 Forest Hills Drive, Summit County. Thanks. Um, I'd like to address uh, Mr. Port's concept plan, the, the town core master plan. Um, um, I just feel that the scope of the buildings is way out of scale with the town core. Uh, it's massive, it's monumental, it's monolithic. Um, and I, I don't think it's uh, in the faith of all the master plans that this town has done in the town core that envision smaller buildings. Um, specifically, if you look at the branded hotel and then the length of this Labonte mixed use building, it's 1200 feet from one end to the other lining Labonte. That makes a wall, it's 60 feet tall. If you're on the other side of that, away from the lake, you're going to be walled off. No vehicle access, no pedestrian, no visual. But if you're lucky to be on that side of the wall, it's great. You have the mountains, the lake, and all that. So uh, I think we really have to consider this master plan now before it goes any further. We can't just keep seeing these images and say, oh, that's great. I mean, did you see the municipal building? Does that say mountain lake architecture? I don't think so. So why don't we get in the right direction and maybe give Mr. Port, uh, I guess, constructive criticism versus we don't want it. Because I hope he's very successful, but not this way. Thanks. Thank you. And next we have Barb Richard. So I'm a little confused because I didn't see that there was a public yeah, well, let me, it, hey, Nathan or Kathleen, if you're listening, for item six, since it's an ordinance, we're doing a public hearing, right? It's a public hearing. It's just a, like the first yeah. go around. It's the same thing. Okay. So, yes, I understand it's confusing because it doesn't say it on there, but because it's an ordinance, anytime we consider an ordinance, there'll be a public hearing. So, if, and you, you're welcome to do it now, too. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, there's... <laughs> Um, so Barb, yeah. yes, Barb Richard, uh, 152 Tenderfoot Street. I'm a resident, a voter, um, served 12 years on parks, and I had a few concerns. So um, part of it is um, I did attend Mr. Port's, um, I'll call it his sales pitch on Saturday, and I was... Um, I was a little frustrated by the fact that questions weren't really answered. There was a lot of spin. Um, there was a lot of um, promotion of the new uh, public and private partnership and that whole idea for all of the public lots. So um, it was a little bit about the branded residences, but three other things. But some of the things that came out of that meeting that concerned me that I wanted to uh, speak with council about were that I want to know what he has successfully completed in Colorado. So Siena Lake is sitting idle, although the Siena Lake Metro District is issued over 24 million in bonds in 2021. So I'm a little confused about why that's not moving forward and what's going on there. I asked him about how he was running the financial numbers for the, uh, the, the revenue that will be generated by the new branded residences. And he, after several minutes, he did state that it was, they used 65% in preparing the revenue projections as the year round occupancy. Decimetrics average for the mountain West is 48%. Uh, that means those projections are off by 26%. In addition, with a branded residence, you have to account for reward stays. And those are point stays, also known as point stays, which do not pay sales tax. So you have to be careful about what you're projecting that it's going to earn. I, am, I have a great concern over the right of claim, and I find that fascinating because um, it's kind of a threat that he will go in and do the right of use if he can't get the PUD passed. Um, so it was very much a carrot and stick presentation, shall we say. Um, and I, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing because if he comes in and does right of use, then he loses money from the 
metro district that is there to fund the public park space and possibly, and I didn't quite understand if the tower is also considered public park space. So if he comes in with a basic right of use claim, uh, he loses some funding from the metro district, as far as I understand. The other thing was that he, you know, council stated from the beginning, from the metro, metro district, through the PFA, the RRA, the PIFs, the TIFs, that the community would be protected because town council would have final approval on the projects. But now Mr. Port is saying that that's not true. He has direct right of use and all it has, all it takes is staff approval. So very concerning. Um, I also think that the referendum, you know, really showed up that people are very concerned about this and that more discussion is needed. And I said that from the very beginning in the Metro District, Metro District discussions mm -hmm. that we really needed some community uh, input and uplift and buy-in. People need to kick the tires. And what is very clear is that many people are completely confused over this. And, the, and as we he discusses the public-private partnership, it gets even more convoluted. So I certainly hope. Um, oh, and also I was looking back through the, he mentioned that there were 15 public hearings, which is not accurate. And there were six focus groups and I, of course, I wanted to know who in this room actually attended a focus group. Anybody in here? So I would like to know who was invited to those. And he mentioned that staff identified the people that were in those focus groups. So a lot of it is it's extremely concerning. It's a lot of money, a lot of money. It's a big metro district. You're, if you go with the metro district, you hand over a lot of power. And so it has to be carefully thought through. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Iwashko. If you would state your name and address for the record, and then I'll start your five minute timer. Of course, uh, my name is Andrew Iwashko. I go by Andre. Uh, I currently live on 75 Vendette Road in Silverthorne, Colorado, but have been a resident in Dillon for several years at 105 Village Place. Um, during my time in uh, Dillon, grew to love this community, um, became a part of my identity living up here, um, and just loved and saw the potential of this community. And um, my experience here in Summit County, um, I've worked in the coffee industry for a while, um, helped start Brett Coffee Roasters from the ground up, and really loved that experience of building a local business, being integrating it into the community, you know, sharing that with other businesses. And why the reason why I decided to come up and speak today is um, I've had the dream of opening up a coffee shop in Dillon for at least three years now. And uh, for one reason after another, um, it's just it, it, I can't make it work. And one reason could be financial. One reason can be um, opportunity. But I kind of want to focus the conversation on the present. You know, we talk about everything that we want to do in the future. But these projects, like, yes, some of them from my perspective is like, oh, this could be a wonderful opportunity, but that could be three, four years from now, if we're talking realistically. So what I'm asking is we need more assistance for local business owners to come in and find ways to get businesses up and running, build that identity. Because quite frankly, when I do come here to do my weekly bowling league, uh, stop by the post office, it feels like a ghost town. And Dylan doesn't deserve that. And again, as a potential business owner here in Summit County, uh, in Dillon, you know, one of the reasons why I'm not ready to take on these huge financial risks is because I need to have proof of concept. That being said, I need to see that traffic is being driven. As a local business owner, I cannot be the reason why traffic is coming to Dillon. We need the help of town council getting creative, finding ways to bring people and spend hours in Dillon instead of half an hour. So all I'm asking for is continued support, looking at what kind of more incentives you can bring in to bring local business owners, because there are people out there, including myself, that want to do something in Dillon, want to build that identity, bring revenue, bring in money, you know, and uh, quite frankly, I've, I'm getting exhausted. I'm, I've been, you know, felt defeated several times, including last week. Uh, 
on another venture I was exploring here. And um, yeah, um, you know, to a point where I may have to move on and explore other opportunities. So um, Dylan is the place that my dream is set on and all we're asking, and I know a lot of other people have that same dream. So we need as much help as we can get. And again, it can't fall on the business owners and we need to focus on the present because it shouldn't be a ghost town for the next couple of years. We need to get this addressed ASAP. So thank you for your time and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Laura Johnson. If you would state your name and address for the record, then I'll start your five. Minutes. My name is Laura Johnson and I live at 334A Ensign Drive in Corinthian Hill and I'm a resident of Dillon. And I wanna thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. And I've been a resident up here for 35 plus years. I'm a licensed CPA, I'm a licensed real estate broker, and I'm the finance officer for a special district in Breckenridge. So I have an understanding of special districts such as Metro districts and revenues generated through sales, lodging and use taxes, as well as property taxes generated through mill, mill levies on real property, such as on your home and on the properties Mr. Porritt is proposing in his PUD. My concern about Mr. Porritt began back at the beginning, and it was generated by my knowledge of Mr. Porritt's involvement with the Siena Lake development in Gypsum, Colorado, because as far as I could tell, this development has gone nowhere since its PUD, appro PUD approval in 2018. I have been confused by the different steps Mr. Port and the town of Dillon have taken, especially the development of multiple metro districts and the finance agreement that the town of Dillon has signed with Mr. Port. I appreciated the meeting last Saturday with Mr. Port, thank you, as it motivated me to dig in and do my research. And I have actually been shocked by what I have found out. I have read through the 2023 Triveni Square Metro District Service Plan, which is for the town of Dillon, and the public finance agreement with the town of Dillon. And quite frankly, I'm greatly concerned, especially in light of what has happened with the Siena Lake Metro District, which Mr. Port proudly stated last Saturday that he was involved with the initial approved PUD in 2018 for 591 residential units and the subsequent Metro District federal and Colorado tax exempt bond sales of $24.5 million in 2021. These bond sales were for the same purpose that his Triveni Square Metro Agreement and Dillon is responsible for. Street improvements, water improvements, sanitation improvements, safety protection, transportation, and please don't forget mosquito protection. The Siena Lake development has changed time several times since the PUD approval in 2018. And just today, I attended the annual Siena Lake Metro District meeting mm -hmm. online with the Metro District. And they announced that to date, today, June 25th, 2024, the infrastructure has not been completed. None of the 591 homes have been sold or completed, much less completed. The project has been stalled for almost three years since the $24.5 million bonds were sold and six years since the approval of the PUD. One would think the developer needs to develop their project in order to pay the bond interest, but no, the Siena Lake Metro District has been using bond proceeds to pay the bond interest, although this allocated money per the Metro District meeting today, allocated money will end out end at the end of 2024. At some point, if the project never gets off the ground, which many people think will be the case, the Metro District can simply default on the bonds and they will start all over again. What did Mr. Port make off this project in Gypsum? I don't know for sure, but I think he made money when the bonds were underwritten. $914,000 was the cost to issue these bonds in the bond um, prospectus. 
And just a mere 1% of the $24.5 million in bonds is $245,000. I think we can safely guess you have made money, made more than that on this failed development. I'm curious, what does this remind the town council of? It reminds me of Uptown 240 where the developer front loaded the development and received their money in deposits and loans, and then they defaulted, leaving a big mess in Dillon, which we see every day. And now the irony is that we have another developer who front loaded a develop in, development in gypsum with a metro district selling 24.5 million in federal and Colorado tax exempt bonds. And the project has not completed its infrastructure or even one single residence. Lord, and now this same up. developer owns Uptown 240, and I will wrap it up, and is trying to gain approval for the branded residences at the Ptarmigan Best Western. Do you realize that Mr. Port's finance agreement with the town of Dillon has the ability to issue $120 million in federal and Colorado tax exempt bonds? What's a mere 1% of that? That's $1.2 million. And to just put that $120 million debt in perspective, the town of Dillon has a hundred, or the town of Breckenridge has 105 million in debt. The Breckenridge Metropolitan District, which just built a new water plant, has 52 million in debt. Fourth Street Crossing in Silverthorne has 52 million, and Maryland Creek, which has a half a billion in real property value, has just 23 million dollars in have debt to, outstanding. I have to cut you off there, Laura. Okay, well I'll finish it in the public hearing then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Richard. Hi. I would state your name and address for the record and I'll start your now six minute timer. Okay, Chris, Chris Richard, 152 Tenderfoot Street, 39 year resident, Summit County, 27 years in Dillon. Um, I wasn't gonna start there, but here's Sienna Lake Metro District. This little part here, and there's four little uh, model homes right there. None of them have a certificate of occupancy, and you can see there's nothing else. Anyone who wants to see this picture, it's just this part here. There's nothing built. So, um, okay, here's what I'm going to start off with. I'm just looking at overall town of Dillon, you know, where we are, where we're trying to go. And I think we need more uh, public process, true public process where we're allowed to speak and talk with our town council members or the PNZ committee. When we come to these minute meetings, we have five minutes to speak and then that's it. No matter what else is said, we're, we're not allowed to contribute. So I think part of our issue here, which is shown by the referendum is that some communication steps were skipped and now we're staring down a, a referendum that may, you know, tie us up all summer. If that vote gets put off to October 1st, then this will go through July, August, September. Um, I had Adrian check the last two town elections, 2018 and 2022, 155 people voted in 2018 and 201 voted in 2022. Those were both in April town council member elections, and the average of that is 178. The petition, referendum petition had 250 approved signatures. So, you know, it looks to me like a vote would be very, uh, if this goes to referendum, the 250 people that signed could probably defeat it since the, the biggest turnout was 201 in 2022. Um, as far as the council goes, I think you have a chance to fix something that happened three months ago. Um, that vote, I believe, was four to two on the referendum, and two of those council votes are no longer on council. So only two of the people um, are still here on the Dillon Town Council. Um, I went to the June 5th, P and Z meeting, and um, 
That was very interesting. And we we got a packet here. And I think this might help your discussion on the branded reverend, re residence. The, the last item, I'll read this. Without the branded residence project, much of the concept presented in the master plan cannot be realized. Is that something we can put on the screen, those eight properties that are in the master plan? We'll work on it, but why okay. don't you keep talking? Well, they're, they're, um, it's, this isn't the branded residence. This is the much bigger concept. And one of the speakers before talked about slowing down. And I absolutely think we need to slow down, whether it's money or communication. People just are unsure. And if you've lived here a long time, we've all heard of these pie in the sky concepts and and a lot of them never came to anything and we could you know we're spending time and money when we're going through these concepts okay um as far as the branded residence being built by right i have a my issue is money because we're doing tif tax incentive funding financing and then as far as the Jake Porat master plan, that includes public land. So to not include public comments and actual uh, public meetings or master planning, uh, you know, not just one person presenting a master plan, I disagree with that. If I, if I own the land outright, I agree, I, and I'm gonna pay for it, then yeah, you can do what's legally right. But when you ask for public land or tax incentive funding, and you don't properly inform the public, I think, I think that's where a lot of this, uh, you know, train wrecks coming from. As far as the port master plan, the police station and town halls being moved. So that's a massive cost and the police station regulations and, you know, evidence and, you know, all those type of things, those new laws or new new rules are probably much more expensive than the, the current police station. If you see the poor at master plan, there are 10 businesses in the pain building. What what's there's no comment on what's going to happen to them. So that, that seems pretty tough. Um, it's not even mentioned. The only, you know, the most important thing is cash flow, not, you know, the 10 businesses that are in there. Um, as far as the Port Master Plan, Port owns one of the eight parcels of land. So the five are private, three are public, and Jake Port owns one of those lands. So the response to the referendum is to make a bigger plan. And, and we're still not comfortable with step one that has to be approved to finance all these other plans, which seems to me to be a waste of resources, time and money. Um, one of the PNZ- Chris, I have to cut you off here. That's six minutes. Sorry. Okay, but you didn't give me a, a warning or can I just have 30 seconds? Um, it, you can have 20 seconds. Okay. We also have legal issues. Those are the referendum, the legal issue with the church amphitheater. We have an EEOC letter of determination that we violated the Title VII 1964 Civil Rights Act that we'll have to spend time and money on to defend. We have legal issues with a metro district. I do have to cut you and off. And we have to hire an attorney. And here's the attorney uh, services contract. I think you should put... Um, metro district experience for your next town attorney. That's might help you. great feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to go. Thank you. Um, okay, that's it. Actually, everybody had signed up. So is anybody else here to make a public comment tonight and didn't get a chance to sign in? If you would go ahead up to the um, podium, state your name and address for the record. And we're uh, Scott Downen, 0066 County Road. 1042 Frisco, Colorado. Uh, I've been a resident here for about 42 years and a business owner for 40 years. Um, the business that I had was civil construction and I was able to work with all the communities within Summit County. And it's been a real joy. Over that time, I've got to know all the council members, ex-mayors, <laughs> 
and so on. And what I'd, what I'd like to share is, I believe this project, after watching all the community's growth for 40 years, is it appears that we're trying to push this project ahead so quickly. And I think that the master plan is so huge that without extreme thought and taking a step back and taking a breath and reviewing the finance agreement, vetting our developer a little bit better and going a little slower, I think in the end we would take great steps forward. Um, you know, some of the issues I have were when we had public comments about owning or developing workforce housing up at the cinema. I own Dillon Ridge Apartments. I was one of the, I was the first developer in this town and contractor to build workforce housing with the town of Dillon in conjunction with Summit Housing Authority. And when I heard that my neighbor, Brian Mitchell, that owns the theater, was going to sell to the Port Group, I immediately called Brian. And because I had tried to buy that property time and time again from my neighbor. And come to find out, Brian had no intention of selling it. And there was never any discussion of selling it. And for the developer to come to town and tell the council that he, in fact, had a deal struck with my neighbor kind of shocked me. And it, so, so I wonder how much more misleading is going on. When I look at the overall master plan and I see a developer put 150 units down on some of the best real estate, workforce housing units on the best real estate that Dylan has. Well, first of all, 150 units don't fit on that parcel. That would require three solid acres of space. And you don't have three acres there. So for a developer to go down there and say, hey, town of Dillon, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to plan this for 150 units on your best real estate down here on the corner with the best views, and it won't even work, only for someone to come back to you guys in two to three years down the road if the development even began and say, oh, we can only fit 48 down there. And the businesses he's proposing aren't even included in the square footage of the three acres. So these are the red flags that come up to me. And I appreciate all the comments that everybody's come up with because I think the town of Dillon, can, can we just slow down a little bit and take this step by step a little closer? We're in no hurry right now. Our developer's not going away. He's going to stay. We just need to work with him, and there needs to be more clarity. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here to make a public comment? Nita? If you would state your name and address. Um, Nita Lisa Jargetson, 309 Tenderfoot Street. Um, I think... I think that we have gotten to this place now um, because as we came out of the COVID years and into 2022, 2023, the town, we were all ready to, everybody was ready to get back into life and get back on track and get business going. And the town, we needed to do that. And um, I think that somebody uh, took it upon or were instructed to... <coughs> put out feelers for uh, a developer and some ideas of what could we do with what we had at that point in time. And I think, you know, Jake and his group showed up and they have in 2023, I think it was brought something to the table. And um, I think council or I, I I think people were excited. It was like, okay, let's just get this on board. Let's get this started. We need to do this right now. And uh, 
I, I think that um, at that point, um, we had a master plan. The town had a master plan. There had been some other things that had happened in the past that kind of took off the master plan, took away from it. So we feel kind of that maybe we don't have to stick with that master plan anymore. It's old. It's dated. There's a whole new world out there. And I think we need to really, this is an opportunity with this referendum and where we're at right now. I think this is an opportunity for us to just take a pause and the town, the people here, the residents, I think they are woke up to what is at stake now to their town and where they're living and their community and the sense of what they want the future to go forward to. And so I think that that is a very, I think that's something we should respect and tr try to honor. And I think we can see more and there'll be more improvement if we could take a break and, and kind of massage what's going on and, and give Jake a, a, a chance maybe to maybe come back a little bit different than what he's operated as with the Metro district tool. That's kind of a scary thing for me from what I've been reading for the last four or five years, how things they've used it, how it's turned out, how it's changed. And it's like, maybe this is a chance for you even to like, we could massage things different with how finances work, how these bonds work and stuff. So, um, I just, I just think I would like to see a break. I'd like a pause and I would like um, us to think about it a little bit more. And I'm, I, I'm willing to put my time in with a group of people and get involved to be part of the community. And thank you very much. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Great. If you would state your name, I'll start your five minute timer. My name is Nicole and I'm a registered voter of Dillon and a resident of Dillon. And I just want to say, like, I really hope you hear people out today and give people an opportunity to vote and have a voice. The residents of the community, the people that live here every day, um, whether that's through a vote or some other way, but give people a, a voice. I really would like to see people have a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else here to make a public comment tonight? Okay. Up next, uh, item five on the back, presentation of the 2023 financial statements from Hinkle and Company. Is Jim here? I didn't see him come in. He's right in. There's a whole bunch of people. Oh, he is back there. Jim, nice to see you. Come on up the podium if you would <laughs> everyone's here to see you here yeah. we've missed you I, this I past see year. everybody came out to hear the accountant talk <laughs> usually about now everybody leaves <laughs> uh thank you very much for allowing me to take a little bit of your time I, obviously you've got a big night tonight i won't take a lot but i did want to give an update on on the audit process and the completion of the financial statement and uh, the ACFA that you have up on the screen. <clears throat> My name is Jim Hinkle with Hinkle and Company CPAs, uh, and we did perform the annual audit of the financial statements. That process starts with us updating our understanding of the town's internal accounting controls. <clears throat> what we're primarily looking for is a segregation of duties. Transactions take typically three steps, the initiation, the approval, and the recording of that transaction. And we don't want one person to do all of those steps. Uh, having a second set of eyes on the, in those transactions greatly reduces the chance of fraud or unintentional errors. Uh, we then go through a test to controls where we take a sample of disbursements and payroll transactions and we test whether or not the control features are working as intended the approval of invoices before the payments made, proper account coding in the general ledger, those types of things. Uh, we do this for a couple of reasons. The first is we're looking for what we call significant deficiencies 
or material weaknesses in internal controls. And those are terms of art for us. A significant deficiency is de defined as a design flaw in the system of internal accounting controls that would allow an error to go undetected in the ordinary course of, course of business. And a material weakness is a significant deficiency that could end up in a material misstatement to the financial statements. And based upon our analysis, as well as our testing, we did not find any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal controls, and that the internal controls are operating as intended. That's one of the answers that you want to hear. <clears throat> the next reason we do that is for us to assess yeah. our risk. Is the risk of a financial statement being correct? It helps us design our tests within the audited financial statements. We use what we call substantive procedures, which is primarily test to details, which is pretty much what it sounds like. We drill down into account balances and we look at the underlying transactions and we compare those to source documents like invoices, deposits of cash receipts, contracts and agreements to ensure that those accounts balances are accounted for correctly. Uh, we also use a lot of analytic review where we're comparing this year to last year to budget, balance sheet to income statements. We're looking for relationships that we either can't explain or didn't expect. And if we have those, we do more test of details. The end result of that is our audit opinion. Uh, your opinion is what we refer to as a unmodified opinion. In layman's term, that's a clean opinion. States that the financial statements have been prepared in accordance with general accepted accounting principles and applied on a consistent basis with the previous year. That's the answer that you want to hear. Uh, the audit is complete. Uh, it has been issued. Uh, it's going to be sent off to uh, the um, uh, uh, state uh, by the end of July when it's due. So all filing requirements will be done uh, and met as appropriate. Um, we are issuing a required communication letter where we're required to communicate in writing if certain events occur in the course of the audit and we have nothing negative to report in that letter. We did not have any disagreements with management. We did not have any difficulties in the course of the audit. We did not have any adjustments where we found errors in the books and records that we required that to be adjusted, nor did we find any errors in the books and records that were not large enough in and of themselves to be made uh, and so we did not have any of these audit adjustments at all. The books and records were presented fine. Um, <clears throat> probably the most important thing that I like to tell the uh, governing body is that throughout the course of the audit, we as auditors felt as though we had open transparency. Everything that we asked for, we were provided in a timely fashion. We were not refused access to any source documents. We felt like we asked we needed to and to perform whatever procedures we felt necessary to meet our professional standards. So we did have that uh, open transparency. We did have a little bit of a change this year. We had an outgoing finance director and an incoming finance director. Uh, but I will say that things went smooth. And uh, even though we had that change over handoff, if you will, uh, things went smooth. The audit went well. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank uh, the entire accounting department. We uh, are, uh, in addition to their daily jobs, uh, and we ask a lot of questions, and we ask for a lot of information, and everything that we ask came back uh, in a timely fashion. We didn't have to wait on anything. So all in all, it went well. It went smooth. You got another good financial statement out, and you've met the state deadline. Um, and so we're in good shape. Great. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for being here and explaining all that to us. And glad with the results. Thank you very much. And to the accounting department, <laughs> everyone who is working on that. There you MK. Go. Thank you all. All right. Everyone can head home now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Item six. This is the reconsideration of ordinance number 224 series of 2024. There is a public hearing of an ordinance approving a level four development application for a PUD development plan. Sorry, for 626 and 652 Lake Dillon Drive and 153 and 223 West Labonte Street. 
Um, this is a public hearing, so I'll open it up at 751. We'll hear from. Oh, Melinda, great. Sound attorney. Great. Yeah, just, just to clarify, can you guys hear me? I can't see you for some reason, but there is actually not a public hearing on the ordinance tonight. Um, if you choose to, um, if you're interested in potentially repealing ordinance number two, 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 224, um, that's just on first reading tonight. So we'll have to set a public hearing at a later date. Sorry, say, so there is no public hearing on this one? No public hearing tonight, correct. If, yep, yeah, the public hearing, should you choose to repeal ordinance um, 224 will be at your next meeting. If repeal, if oh, okay, okay. So, okay, so if, okay, so there's only a public hearing tonight if the vote is, no, sorry, there's only a public hearing if the vote tonight is, so you, we either choose option one or two, and if we choose option one, if we choose option one to repeal it, then there's our, then there's going to be a public hearing at the next meeting? Correct, yep, because it's, you have to, to repeal it by ordinance, and you are required um, under your charter to have two readings um, for all ordinances. Got it. Okay, so I misinformed the public. So instead of starting item six, I'd like to reopen public comments. If you didn't get a chance to make your comment during citizen comments because I told you there was going to be a public hearing and now I'm told I can't do one. Um, we're going to continue citizen comments. Can I do that? Can I reopen citizen comments since I misinformed everyone? Sure, that's fine. So we're going to reopen it up. If you were saving your comment for the falsely promised public hearing, then I'm going to give you your opportunity now. Um, this is the public hearing for after, we're going to do it after item five right now. So is anybody here to comment on this that was expecting a public hearing and didn't get to make their comment? No. So I don't think I can give you more time since it's a regular public hearing, but if the motion is to go into item one, there will be a public hearing again. So. Um, anyone else? Yep, please. Yep. Okay. Go ahead, please. No, 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 please. Go ahead. So, so Nita, I won't be able to give you more time. Oh, you can't give me more time? No. Or another chance? No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm not quite sure if this is appropriate venue for this, but um, I, would you please start by your oh, name and address? Oh, my name is Robin Robson. I live at 19 Lowell Court in Dillon, Colorado. Um, I, if anybody is interested, I'm trying to get people together with, to get um, information, an email chain to get information, to get um, with the future vis vision of Dylan, um, to get coordinated um, with statements to the papers and things such as that. Um, so I'll be passing this around. Please sign up for it if you're interested in it. If not, that's fine. But I just want to get a little bit more coordinated. It seems like people are coming at this from different places, but have the same heart. So if anybody's interested, please, uh, I'll be passing this around. Would you sit, tell me your first name one more time? Robin. Robin Robinson. Ro Sorry. Robin Robson. My mother thought he's funny. That's right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you initiated okay. the re referendum petition. Yeah. You Thanks. Um, anyone else planning to make a public comment during? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Either, you would uh, your name and address. Yeah, Chad. The line 109 gold run circle um so uh like i said my name is chad i'm a third generation dylan uh homeowner and visitor a, a, as well we have deep roots in dylan our house on gold run was actually the old ranger station where the town used to be before the lake was poured uh so my grandpa in 1963 bought it moved it up to gold run and since then our cousins have had their cabin next to ours as well and uh uh, we've just had um, a lot of fun, and it, it's it's great to see all the what's what all, all of what's coming along right now. Um, and then additionally, we have some slips at Dillon Marina, and have had decades of fun on the lake, and uh, enjoy that. So I just want to express my up utmost support, which might be weird in this room, but just for the branded development project. Um, you know, as, as it'll bring many benefits to us, longtime property owners, um, and we see this project as an attractive initiative that will energize the waterfront for decades to come. Uh, we, we look forward to having the same walkable access to restaurants, to stores, attractions, and more 
that most of every, of every other mountain town has, uh, at least of the ones that are surrounding us. And uh, we appreciate the port group's commitment and careful th thoughtfulness as well as the town's uh, careful thoughtfulness as well. And I think that overall, if it, you know, I, I've, there's been personal attacks against, I know the poor group and there's personal attacks against some of the council, you know, if it wasn't, it, it's not about Jake, it's not about the poor group. If it was any other de uh, developer, everybody would try to be finding a red herring about this and would just kind of use it because people don't like change. And I'm just excited for what's coming. And um, I think that it's going to be beneficial as time goes on. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else planning to make a public comment tonight in the back? If you would state your name and address for the record, and then I'll start your five minute timer, six minute timer. Uh, my name's Nick Dunham. I live at 590 Straight Creek in Dillon. I'm also the owner of the Dillon Laundromat at 119 Labonte. And I've been coming to the meetings for about two and a half years, about this, about as long as this has been going on. As soon as the Metro District came up with that, uh, with the pain building on the chopping block, I became very interested in what was going on here. Um, I've seen, you know, the first pitch with the Metro District, I've kind of seen all, um, all phases of this going through. And I think we've kind of come to a point where it's either this plan A or plan B. And I think plan A, which is the current um, development idea is the best one. Um, it's taken me a long time to kind of grapple with that and come to that conclusion. I didn't like the plan at first, um, but it's the direction it's going to go regardless. So I think it's just kind of better to have a better footprint on that property than having the brick. Um, I'm also a little concerned of what this one development could spark me as a business owner there um, in the pain building. Most everyone is pretty much on edge all the time of uh, what's going to happen to the that building, what's going to happen up the street, across the street, um, you know, pretty much anything that is, I'll say, 30 years old, I think is up for grabs. And that's not all a bad thing. I think we just have to be a little cautious of it. Um, but I think this plan that we have in front of us is probably the best that we got. So. That's all. Thank you. Anyone else planning to speak tonight? Please, if you would, uh, state your name and address for the record, and I'll start your five-minute timer. <clears throat> My name is Kevin Clary. I live in Dillon and Summit Cove. I've been the uh, owner and operator of Lake Dillon Liquors and Lake Dillon Bike Rentals for the last 35 years. Obviously, I'm not too excited about um, having Town Hall moved on top of my building. <laughs> But, um, and then I don't understand why it's either this or that, you know, why, why we can't have something in the middle. I get it. We're not going to build it to the maximum, but, uh, so on this lakefront thing, he does own Uptown 240. I'd love to see that fixed. I've been looking at that hole in the ground for like three and a half years now. Cause the hotel took about three and a half years. Um, I don't get why it's either going to be, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that on the lakefront. It's like, well, It'd be nice if there was something in the middle. We really shouldn't have to choose. I get it. He's trying to do, um, you know, I don't understand about all this um, financing. It scares me. I'm, I'm, I had a property in Eagle's Nest. That metro district kind of went broke. Um, I was in Hamilton Creek, went broke. You know, it sounds, I'm going to apologize for my language, but I think it's kind of funny to say. I don't think they're going to let him forget that he screwed the pooch over in gypsum or something. What's going on over there? Doesn't sound good. You know, I don't know what's going to happen here in Dillon. But uh, do we have to level the whole town and have all these giant buildings? Or can we just get Uptown 240 done? You know, if he wants to do the lakefront, let him do the lakefront however he wants to do it. But um, let him do up whatever he wants to do to finish Uptown 240. Get that done. Those four people lost their deposits, their money. Otto Borgos went broke. They probably lost their property. He just, you know, pleased it up. I know he's talked to my landlord, Mark, and, you know, Mark's interested. Mark thinks it's, you know, inevitable and might be a good plan, but these are some crazy plans. I mean, he's done the numbers backward, backwards, forwards, upside down, sideways, but I, I don't know. 
I didn't, the guy at the movie theater said he wasn't interested in selling his property to him, but yet he said he was going to do that. We had this meeting the other night that they showed uh, these four plans. Uh, Renee, are you on the um, planning and zoning? No. Oh, I thought it was you that said that you didn't like any of the designs for the town hall as it was going to be moved to the building where I'm at. Uh, nope, that was <laughs> <laughs> I looked at that. Anyway, the lady, the lady just said that she thought that all the designs were hideous and they didn't really fit in, you know. Um, but uh, I, I get it, you know, change is inevitable. Yes, you know, he did say we all want to retire. Yes, I've done, I've worked for 35 years, but I'll have nothing left. I'll go bankrupt, you know, he's gonna, why do we have to level everything in Dillon just to get Uptown 240 finished and maybe just let him do what he wants to do on the, the lakefront? That's really all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here to make a comment tonight? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to reconsideration of ordinance number 224 series of 2024 and ordinance approving a level four development application for a PUD development plan for 626 and 652 Lake Dillon Drive and 153 and 223 West Labonte Street. Nathan? Turn this over to Ned. Great, Ned. Town planner, senior town planner, Ned West. Do you want to? Um, what would you like me to talk about? I, you know, we've never done this before. We're all well, sort of, this previously is previously approved this on March nineteenth, and um, we did a rather extensive presentation that night. Um, almost an hour on my part. So is this better? Yes. Okay, I'll try to speak up. Um, this uh, application was approved by town council on March 19th of this year. Um, both Jake and I gave extensive presentations at that time. Um, my presentation was almost an hour um and uh was rather detailed uh i'm happy to answer any questions you all may have if you'd like me to run um kind of through the basics of the development i'll try to recall that um if that would be helpful that, i think that would be helpful three of the council members sitting at the at the um dais were not present for that decision in, in the Oh, you yeah. were. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, um, two. So uh, essentially the project um, is a five-story building. Um, the design of the, the building steps down with the grade of, of, the, of Lake Dillon Drive, which slopes down towards the lake. Um, there are proposed 200 residential units in the complex. Um, the concept behind the development is that it would be a branded residence. And essentially what that is, is there's um, private ownership in individual units. Um, and then there is a management company that manages all of the units. And the concept is that um, owners would occupy or could occupy their units for up to say a quarter of the year. And the remainder of the time, those units would be um, on a short-term rental basis managed by a primary operator, such as a, a hotel chain. Um, in addition to the 200 residential units, uh, there's a rooftop restaurant. There's also three, two or three other restaurants along Lake Dillon Drive and Lodgepole Street, and an, another 10 or so um, retail spaces. Um, as we've looked at it and knowing the vibrancy of that area with all of the concerts, I could see uh, more restaurants potentially being down there. Um, or bars and things like that, uh, and maybe a, a bike shop. Um, so uh, lots of ideas uh, that, that kind of come to mind there. There's also a public space um, on Lake Dillon Drive. Uh, it's about 80 feet from the intersection of Lake Dillon Drive and Labonte Street. And then it tapers away from Lake Dillon Drive to be about 170 feet away from Lake Dillon Drive. So this creates this view corridor and a, a public plaza, um, not only serving the retail and commercial spaces and restaurants, but um, green space uh, with uh, potentially public art, um, benches, places to sit, bike racks, 
place for food trucks, in fact. Um, so some vibrancy created there um, in, a, in a public realm. Uh, the, and, and I know Barb Richard questioned, uh, the concept would be for a rooftop um, observation tower as the concept drawings in the PUD are shown, it's, it looks somewhat like a clock tower, but that would be open to the public for visitors to the town or community members to go up there and, and check out a, a beautiful view. Um, in addition to that, uh, part of the private residences has a, a pool terrace. Um, so that would be a private pool, um, which overlooks the lake. And they also have an upper level um, open space terrace uh, for, I'd imagine, grilling and, and hanging out, hot tubs or whatever might ultimately be up there, uh, depending on the programming of the final building. Uh, the building is currently proposed in the residential zone district. Uh, the maximum building height in the residential high zone district uh, is 35 feet plus eight, so 43 feet. And the proposed structure um, is right around 55 feet to the general rooftop um, elevation. And then there's that little pop-up for the observation tower that does get up um, a bit higher, I think, up to perhaps 62 feet. Um, let's see. Uh, there are two levels of underground parking proposed, so all of the parking will be confined within the structure. Um, it is overparked, um, so it provides enough parking for the commercial uses um, to include the restaurants and the servers that would work there per our code. Um, we have criteria that would say per so many square feet, you must have this many parking spaces. For a restaurant, that's one parking space per 120 square feet, and that for um, the workers in the restaurant as well. Um, and there's, in addition to commercial parking, there's also ample parking for uh, the residential units. Um, Question for Deb? Please. So when you first presented this to us, you recommended that we approve the project. Can you elaborate on what that recommendation was based on? Uh, sure. Um, well. And, and first, this came to you after the Planning and Zoning Commission reviewed the application and they made recommendation to the town council to approve the application as well. Um, as we brought it to the town council, uh, we took a much deeper dive into the comprehensive plan and identified some 20 aspects in the comprehensive plan that pointed to this development um, being highly supported um, by the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan is just a general guideline for decision making. It's not binding in any way. It changes over time. We're in fact working on amending it currently, um, have been with the Planning Commission for uh, quite a number of public meetings. Um, so You're saying it's it, completely consistent with the town master plan? It, it was, it, we, we found it to be, that's right. <laughs> I have a question. Can you just explain to everyone what the right by use is? That it's not a threat. That it that how a developer can come into a town and you know fit all the zoning codes and everything, but it doesn't even come to us really for approval because of of the sure. way it's designed. So that might be helpful. Certainly. So use by right is defined in the code. Um, each zoning section of the code, this one being residential high, has certain permitted uses that are a use by right. So somebody can come in with an application in the residential high for condominiums, right? Um, based on the zoning in the code, um, there could be a potential of 240 residential units built on that property as a use by right. Our code has a number of processes for different types of development. A new condominium building would be considered a level three development, and that would require a public hearing before the Planning and Zoning Commission. When there is a use by right, there are very specific code criteria that the Planning Commission must consider. And if the project meets those code criteria, they have no cause to deny it. So it, it, it could essentially be um, approved without um, any, um, any cause to deny. 
that's essentially where the use yeah. by right comes yeah, in. Yeah, thank you. And that, sure. that clarifies it because on this development, you could have 240 units instead of 200. Um, you could be wider, but with a with a height, um, it isn't it, and it isn't it even it isn't higher than really any of the other like at Homewood Suites. It's a, probably about that height, but you have a view corridor down. So, Port made a lot of changes to make it very attractive for the public for public use, and I just wanted people to hear exactly how, why he did and what he did, and the use by right isn't a threat. It is it is our codes. So I just want well, to and, and, and I think he's come quite far along in, in negotiating with the current owners who want to sell and want to retire. Right. And, and so I, I think I, I can't speak for Jake and maybe he would like to, but mm -hmm. I, I think that he's come far enough along that he's very likely going to do one or the other kind well, of. Well, and the Stazels are here and it's private property, so they have a right to sell. And that's the facts. We're going to have council comments. Yeah. Can I ask one question? Yep. Is there any way that the town council can stop a building already? I mean, do we, are we picking shutter colors and brick colors? And uh, we we have design guidelines, um, and so there are certain things that could cause the planning commission or the town to request that a developer take another stab at it. So you would could potentially continue a hearing uh, to a future date and ask that they provide more information or, hey, you need to abide by these guidelines um, for architectural design a little bit better. These colors are clearly out. So there are there are things you could do. Um, property owners have rights. And so, you know, as long as there's code criteria that they are supporting and you don't find something that is objectionable in the code or the comprehensive plan. Um, some things just, there's no basis to deny them. Thanks. Um, I think our uh, Melinda from the attorney's office has her hand up. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to clarify kind of the, the town's council's two options tonight because we have um, received a referendum petition on ordinance 224 um, and that, um, Petition has been deemed sufficient. So at this point, under state law and the charter, you guys have two options to decide. You can either repeal ordinance 222-224, which, which essentially would be a denial of the branded residence project, or you can choose to refer that ordinance to voters, in which case the voters would choose whether or not ordinance 224 would be um, um, approved. So uh, just wanted to, to remind you of your options. Melinda, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, I've, um, I've in the last couple of weeks done some, I've been trying to figure out exactly what we're doing here. And if, if the council here so let's i'm i'm trying to like figure out what will happen with each of these decisions so if we went with decision one and we repeal this the ordinance 224 then the developer could immediately rethink his decision and submit a new plan Yes, he could, um, yes, immediately submit a new plan for the development, in which case, you know, that would be subject to a, another public hearing. Um, so, yes, that would be an option under option one. Okay. And then for option two, if it, so basically we say we stand by ordinance 224 and we refer it to the voters because we can't change the decision we came to. From what I read, that may block the developer if it then gets voted down from submitting another application for, was it 18 months? Um, I mean, he could submit a different kind of plan. I, he couldn't. He could not submit the same exact plan, but he could. It wouldn't prevent him from submitting a different plan Got for it. the okay that property. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Sure. So as long as it's a different plan, it can always be resubmitted. Correct. But if it goes to the people, 
it's going to be that many more months for the process to take before a decision is made for him to produce a new plan. Right. When would that, when would that, it's October. When would that election be if we, if it went to item two, October, October one? October one. October one. That was, that was the only question I have so for right now. On that. Can we open for council comments? Yep. Absolutely. So a lot of the people I've talked to in Dillon and in Summit County um, don't seem to understand what's going on in Dillon right now. Um, we have shrinking tax revenues. You know, in my opinion, we're on a slowly sinking ship and not doing anything means the, sh the ship is going to sink. Uh, just like our coffee guy mentioned, it's a ghost town that we can't attract businesses. We can't attract coffee shops. There's not enough customers. If you walk over to the paint building and walk around it, the paint's peeling, the columns that support that upper walkway are crumbling. I mean, it, there's a term called blight, and blight means disrepair. And much of our downtown Dillon is currently in a state of blight meaning it could be condemned. I mean, is this the town we really want? We want to let it rot under our watch because we were afraid of what a, what a developer would do? That's not what I want. The only way to fix the shrinking tax revenues is to attract businesses. This is what this development would do, in my opinion. And lastly, um, every one of us, you know, if, if this comes up to a vote or if the council members that vote for option one or two, this will be our legacy. We either killed workforce housing, you know, underground parking, and got a building we like less than the one proposed. And I got to give Jake credit. He jumped through a lot of hoops to give us something we wanted. There, the original proposal was really over the top, and pretty much nobody was on board with that. But there, you know, there have been like six or seven iterations with the town staff. And, you know, he's he's done everything we asked him to do. We're not going to get better with any other developer, in my opinion. And I think there's legal things going on with the gypsum thing. I'm sure Jake can shed more light on that, but I think there's reasons that stalled out of his control. Anyway, we all need to decide what is our legacy. You know, you guys are probably going to get the vote on this. We'll get the vote on it tonight. So we're going to own either killing workforce housing, parking, and getting a building we like less, or moving forward with something that I think makes sense in a lot of ways. It may not be ideal, but it's going to be a lot better than some of the other companies coming our way. This point of clarification, there's no workforce housing associated with this property. The second phase that it would fund. Nothing's on paper. Yeah. Nothing's on paper. Nothing on paper is there is no workforce housing approved with this project. It's not approved. Not with this. It's not on paper though. Right. In this project. So okay. Sorry, go on, Dave. I have to say. Would like to go next for council, or did you want to if, respond? If I might, if I might. Thank you. Um, so uh first I wanna thank the council uh for the couple years of work that we to get to the point that we are now. Right. We spent a long time um, evaluating and discussing kind of intent and growth and the objectives of the town. And, um, you know, I know that was a, a big collective effort. And, um, you know, we uh, certainly the, the stamina for any developer who's coming in to try to do this type of work uh, is, is pretty high. The standard that everybody is keeping us to uh, to try to bring a project to fruition. Um, and um, I will thank uh, those who were challenging us because I do think at the end of the day, the project turned out to be a better project than the one that we started with. And so the, the process that was created and the process that we went through um, for those years and that, that investment, um, I think, bore fruit. I mean, there was a negotiated result and that result was, I, um, um, I find, to be much better for the town of Dillon. Um, so. Uh, I will try to address some of the comments about uh, uh, 
outside of this, uh, uh, outside of Dylan and the stuff that we've worked on in the past. And uh, but what I'd like to first uh, continue with is we when we had our recent um, uh, town hall that we called it, where we invited people to come in uh, who were the voters to kind of try to get some feedback. Um, you know, what we took away as we listened to that was that there was um, a frustration, certainly, um, with uh, their sentiment of that there's been a lack of public interface. Um, and when I brought up the 15 separate occasions where I've been uh, or some members of my team have been in, in front of this council uh, and or planning commission. Um, the point I was trying to make is that there were there's been a lot of opportunity for people to get involved and to get to become part of this process. And so I understand the sentiment, um, even though um, there was there really has been a lot of public effort to try to get the word out. And certainly we uh, anybody who's reached out to us, um, I think, would recognize that we respond quickly. We, we try to incorporate ideas um, and we re and we talk to them about. Um, you know the the, the, uh, the what we what we're trying to gain uh, in terms of what's important to the town and the objectives. Um, that's one thing. Um, next is that the uh, we learned that um, the concerns about the metro district is it seems to be that there's just this misunderstanding of the financial instruments. Even the comments tonight uh, demonstrate a, a misunderstanding of what those financial instruments mean and what they do and how they function. Um, and finally, we spent a lot of time on that in the uh, of the two hours of the of, of my time I was taking questions and answers. I'd say about half of that was on the metro district. Um, so, and then finally, um, there was uh, the commentary about the just the the branded residential building and what whether or not um, this is the best iteration that we could come to. So, let me try to further get information out, not misinformation, but positive information um, that's fact about all those items. OK, so uh, first, um, in terms of the building design, um, you know, we uh, our intention was uh, based on we did have multiple focus groups where we met with folks and said what's important. Uh, the sight lines were things that were discussed at multiple meetings, um, and so we incorporated that by through the creation of the public park and moving the building as far as we could away from the intersection so that as you come down Lake Dillon Drive, you have a clear sight line to the water because the introduction of the water as a visual aid is kind of the introduction to Dillon that people wanted to maintain. Uh, secondly, we, we opened up our lobby um, and made that more of a commercial space. Um, I, it, there's been this discussion about whether or not that's a public or private pool. There's, there are public restaurants that have an in, indoor outdoor space utilizing that space um, and the intention there was that if there was a wedding or if there was somebody that they could hire the restaurant and cater the pool area and that could be utilized in that fashion okay so it is intended that the public and more users would be able to have access to those to that platform um, we also created an actual dedicated public space in the in the uh, use of the observation deck so we said this is actually going to be owned by the metro district the metro district will own it so that the public always has access to it um and that was uh and again we're trying to address these multiple concerns that we've that we heard from the public through the through the forums that we could uh, have access to and um as i addressed in the uh discussion on saturday you know we we were going through the process that was guided you know to us and so um you know we we worked trying to circumvent the we, the will of the town council by creating some um, meetings that the town council wasn't going to be a part of. The meeting I had on Saturday uh, to try to get information out is subsequent to the approval, but doing that prior to an approval um, would have felt like I was trying to circumvent the will of the of the town council. I would never do that in any other environment unless the unless the city directed me to do it. So every other city that does have those kind of uh, neighborhood committees, they they set those up so that there's a there's a process by which feedback from that community can be adopted into whatever the the uh, information is that's going to become part of the program. It's not something that somebody goes rogue and does does it on their own. So uh, post approval, it was more appropriate to go to have those kinds of conversations publicly. 
Um, and, you know, we had, uh, in terms of the Metro District, so the Metro District is, and I, I want to, uh, I'll address Siena Lake and the things that happened there and where, where that project is. Um, so Siena Lake, uh, and what it's a feather in our cap, um, when I say our, I mean the Porrick Group and my team. When we went in, we became partners in Siena Lake and um, when we did, there was no, there was a Metro District already in place. The Metro District had already informed, there was already a service plan. What we did is we came in and did all the underwriting, created the math, worked with the existing partners and the existing PUD that was in place and, to, and put together all the information that was necessary to actually go to market. And the way that we conservatively underwrote that information led to the lowest interest rate for any bonds ever sold in Colorado. And the reason I brought that up as a feather in our cap is to say, we were able to keep taxes low for those would-be residences because of the amazing yield that we were able to achieve in the bond market. And so it was a, all of the parties who, you know, DA Davidson and the parties who marketed those bonds, they are the ones who profited through that process. We gained nothing from the Metro District. We, we had no income, we, had, we spent money. You know, we had to buy, pay for the feasibility studies. We had to front load money into the uh, as the developer into so that there could be money in the metro district to run itself. So those are things that we did. It was a cost, it was not an income, and it was certainly the um, at the end of the day, twenty four million is the is the limit. We ended up selling nineteen million of it. Again, we didn't want to maximize the total amount, so we sold nineteen of the twenty four. That was available to us to sell and and 16 of that was set aside with some money set aside for interest reserve because there's always an interest reserve during construction so you set aside an interest reserve and you say look there's going to be some amount of money that we're spending over the next two years and there's not going to be enough income from the taxes to cover that and when they were talking about it today on this uh, Siena lake metro district call what they're saying is that our interest reserve is going away what she didn't, what the parties who listened in or didn't understand is that there's also a surplus reserve. So there's an interest reserve for payments during the first two years, and there's a surplus reserve, which is significant. That's millions of dollars, not just the amount for the interest on 5% over a couple of years. So there's plenty of money in the district uh, to service the debt. Okay. Now let's talk about completion of work. So the first phase of Siena Lake had $16 million worth of infrastructure, roads, water, sewer, the, the actual construction of a lake. Okay, All of that is complete. Today, part of the purpose of the meeting for the Siena Lake Metro District was to repay the developer for $2.9 million worth of lien waivers for work that was also completed. So the Metro District still holding back money, work still getting completed, but it's on another phase. So the first phase was the was the portion of the project that Siena Lakes Metro District was responsible for. After the first phase sells through, that's when that those funds would be used for the second phases of infrastructure. And so, I, you know, all of the layout, all of the planning, all the stuff that we did prior to us selling the housing component, all of that was done as effectively and efficiently as we could do it. And the money's been spent. Uh, and the Metro District has made sure uh, with all the receipts to complete the roads, the water, the lake, the sewer, the light posts, the curb, the gutter, all of it's complete. So of that first phase where the money was raised to be utilized. Okay, so that's that's the reality of Siena Lake. Uh, we're really, I'm proud of that. That's how we set that up. We're, we haven't sold the houses. We're not part of the housing development. So. The party that has has 37 separate applications for building permits in with gypsum, gypsum's not releasing those building permits. That has nothing to do with us. <laughs> I mean, so the, the new builder that took over the housing project is waiting for those building permits. And that's something between the town and them. Um, we are, the only thing we retained in Santa Lake is a parcel for apartments, but we're not allowed to get into that until the, another phase. So they need to go through and sell through 227 homes before I can get into my project. So we're just sitting idle, you're right. I'm waiting for that phase to be completed. And, but I'm seeing that the permits are being pulled and they're just, and Gypsum hasn't get, has yet to release it to them. So that's Siena Lake in a nutshell. It really is a red herring. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, we, we did excellent work and we executed perfectly for what the town was supposed to do, what the housing development was supposed to be. We're really proud of that. Um, so, but it's still an extreme red herring to what we're talking about today. Okay, the Metro District that we are trying to accomplish here, we've already done and reviewed and, and explained and got voted on and approved and it's not going away. Okay, that's, that's already in place. What we're, what we're trying to figure out is how do we fund the Metro District so it can do the work that we wanted it to do. The Metro District has the opportunity to create workforce housing, create parking, and create uh, you know roundabouts and infrastructure and all those great things that the town needs because it can't afford it currently. And so the Metro District is reliant, and I've you know we've talked about this ad nauseum over the several public hearings, but the the branded residential, the reason why it was the first project we brought back in front as the first PUD, is because. 75% to 80% of the total budget of the Metro District is funded via those taxes. And part of the reason we ended up landing there through this process of the Metro District approval was because we wanted to make sure that the taxation on ourselves um, was going to be where the generation of the majority of the taxes were gonna be, and we were gonna control that project. So it was something, it was intentional to say, look, we know if we build this, we're going to have a certain amount of control of over that tax cash flow, and th then we can go ahead and commit to those other projects, the projects. So why did we release recently a PUD uh, that shows some of our planning and opportunity ahead of more vetting from this panel? It's because the, there's this in conversation going around as though we've ignored workforce housing been the case. It's always been part of our plan, but we have to have dedicated funds to create it. So you, the, we still have to go forward with the PUD and you guys will still review it and tell me if it sucks. You know, we'll keep iterating like we did on the other PUD, but when we, and we'll keep pushing because there's no reason to have the Metro District with all that funding in it without the ability to accomplish that work. And what I explained on Saturday is what, where it benefits us as developers is not because we're of fees or income from the Metro District or the bonds. It's that we hope to create a platform on top of a parking deck, which would be fully paid for by the Metro District, where we would have the ability to put workforce housing with inexpensive air right. Right? So we're able to bring the cost of that land basis down so that we can afford to create cheap rent. I mean, that, this is the mechanism, this is the planning, this is what's gone into this process. Um, I will say uh, that early on in the master planning, we did, um, uh, we were working with Brian Mitchell. I can't control what he does or doesn't say at this point. Um, I have a contract I can provide, I did provide to Nick, the prior uh, attorney for the town. Um, we can show multiple monthly update correspondence with us and Brian. Um, so, you know, um, happy to provide that. I, it's unfortunate um, that we are where we are, but he felt the pressure of the Facebook life where everybody was t saying, is, is this guy going bankrupt? Is this guy having problems? And certainly I can understand why he withdrew from the process over the year and a half it took us to get the Metro District approved because that was too damaging to his ability to execute on his own business. So, and so, you know, that's, but that's, Again, these, these are red herrings to what we're here to discuss. The reason this the conversation is binary, the reason why that was the quote in the Summit Daily, which I think I thought was a fair article, is that we've got money that's spent and we can't go through this process again. Like we're not gonna do that. We, we don't, we can't re, rerun another, you know, the millions of dollars that we already have invested we can't do that again with at the chance that we're going to go through another referendum at the end of that cycle. So we either go forward with the plan that we negotiated collectively, that we went through the fair process that was laid out in front of us, and we did that process. We honored that process. And we either go forward with that, or we just build what we're allowed to build already. And what we're allowed to build already, I think, is not as advantageous to the town. And we talked about this balance of scale. The building would be larger, it'd be less attractive, and, and, it, and the sight lines and all the things that we were told that were important from those focus groups and the people that we get feedback from, all that goes away. In addition to that, what goes away is all the bells and whistles of the Metro District. So the people who are out there claiming that 
the workforce housing is important to them, they lose those opportunities because we lose the funding to do that. So, you know, I, so when you look at the weight of the scale of, of the two options in front of us, I, I hope that the public and I hope that this panel understands, you know, we, this isn't meant to be carrot and stick. This is just meant to be reality. Like we, we can't go through, you know, an infinite process, spending infinite amounts of dollars with no end in sight. Like we have to come to some conclusion and, and I hope, you know, and that's kind of, I'll, I'll summarize and just say that, you know, we, um, we, even though we are, when the PUD, if the PUD were to go forward, whether that's via a referendum and then people vote for it or otherwise, um, you know, the PUD is zoning. And that also seems to confuse people. It's not a building permit. So if I could work cooperatively with people, if people wanted to work with me and had a good intention, if it wasn't just, we want, we don't want development, which is what I feel the reality is. But if, if it was more so that they wanted to work cooperatively with me, we can do that with a PUD in place. The PUD, we can sit down with people and say, you know what? Okay, you don't like this, I won't build it. Meaning like, don't you don't like the observation deck? Fine, it's out. I don't have to build it. It's that it's approved so that I can. It's an option affording me the, the opportunity. And so, you know, we can continue an effective dialogue going forward, but it's not, that's not the way that things are operating. And, I, and when I, I asked the public, why do they think that's the case? And there's, it's, they say, it's the history, it's not you, Jake. It's that there's been this sentiment or feeling that, the, that their voices aren't being heard. But I feel like there's, there is community engagement as well. So if the community engages with us and we, and we have this kind of active back and forth dialogue, um, we, as, as we've evidenced in the process, we will take all that into consideration. Quick question for Jake. Yep. If workforce housing is your intention yep. and you're committed, yep. when I asked you in the original hearing, if mm -hmm. as a condition of approval, would you commit to workforce housing? You point blank said, no. You didn't say I'm working on something or whatever you could have said, you just said no. So to me, I hear that as you're not willing to commit to workforce housing and, and others may be more trusting than me, but I'm not trusting of, of a no. So, and I think that's a, I understand how that felt. Okay. But I, but I will say that I think that's a small mischaracterization of the conversation you and I were having in, in this sense, in this sense that the, if when we're talking about a PUD and the conditions to the PUD, okay, what if I'm going to go and we and we did talk about this, that having the use of the funds for the metro district because the workforce housing component is from the metro district, it's not from me. So when when I have to I have to come in front of you and try to get a PUD approved in order to build that workforce housing, I can't tie one PUD to the next PUD to the next. And, and, effect, and effectively hope I can sell bonds. So when I'm when I'm trying to work with you, I, I did bring this up that the bonds would be limited and it would be difficult to sell them if there's some contingency in there in the documentation of the PUD that I'm trying to utilize as the funding mechanism. If that says you have to go find some other real estate and hope that you can build some some workforce housing on it at some later date, it won't work like that. We can say that we need workforce housing. All of the programming that we're trying to accomplish needs workforce housing, and we have no use for the money except for those uses that you guys tell me to use it for. And so I'm going to be looking, saying, hey, let's work out a deal on a piece of real estate to develop where I can put the workforce housing, because otherwise all of this effort to create the metro district was for nothing. It, the the money is going to be in, invested in the metro district so I can deploy it not so I can sit on it. It doesn't do us any good. Then it's just interest rate. Again, then we're just paying the interest carry. So the faster I find a project and, and the queue, up, queue up the next PUD, the better it is. I've heard from Dana. Would anyone else like to share their thoughts here relative to whether they're leaning towards the first or second option? 
I'd like to ask a question and then and then maybe get a, a clarification. But the, the question is, did I hear you say j just you know a few minutes ago that the various taxes kicked off by the branded residents, lodging tax, sales tax, that would those taxes would make up about seventy five to eighty percent of the metro district's budget. The project fund. The project fund. Right. So, so what happens is those ca tax cash flows over the period of time negotiated within the PV PFA, that 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 tax cash flow we we've anticipated based on the underwriting prov provided by DA Davidson and others that do the marketing for those bonds. We said, okay, here's how much sales tax we can anticipate. Here's what the sales of the units will generate. X Y Z. Right. So we go through and we create a different series of taxes and and figure out what the fund is. Then we split it with the town. So 50-50. So whatever that project fund turns out to be, let's say it turns out, which is partially why when somebody mentioned the service plan says there's a hundred some million dollars of- 129, you check. Okay, so, so, so but a half of that goes to the town. So I, I'm just, just so people, I think understand, I, I'm not sure I quite understand this, but, but this, is, this is important. The Metro district is really just additional taxes on top of what you're already paying, what we as citizens are already paying. Texas I, I get it. You create a new, you know, you, you create a new venue, right? The, the branded residents. But I, I guess I'll, what I'm trying to understand is, can we really expect financially enough tax revenue to get kicked off from the branded residents to pay for all those things that you mentioned, affordable housing, roundabouts, a big old parking garage, so, you know, tearing down the various structures and finishing up 240, up, uh, uptown 240. Right, that's, so that's a lot of capital that's required to so the, do all the, of those things. And I appreciate, Oliver, that um, uh, you didn't have the benefit of those two years yeah, of. Yeah. Rachel and I are the newbies. Yeah, right, right. So, so there was an extensive conversation about the underwriting uh, during that process, but at the at, with very conservative numbers, so that, such that you know huge pension funds will buy those bonds. What they do is they look at it and they say, in the worst day. What, what can we expect in terms of lodging receipts in the worst day? What can we expect? And, and, you know, it's based on programming. I'll admit was based on the, what we have for the PUD. So if we don't get the PUD, then we don't know. And then we'll have to figure out what the resulting available tax benefit might be, if any, but if we have the PUD, we know this is how much a restaurant which should anticipate to receive. And, and we, and we had the uses in those spaces and what I can promise you is that those pension funds that are reviewing and providing the capital at a very low interest rate return are going to have a very stringent status of the feasibility studies that support all of those metrics, because they're not going to, you're not going to get a pension fund to give you $60 million. In our, in our case, the total project fund we anticipate is $68 million. Okay, half of 34 million goes to the town. 34 million would be in our bucket to create the public works that the town identifies for us to build. Okay, so we we go in and we say, okay, there's 34 million dollars. That the parking garage that we are proposing for the second PUD is right around there. It's right around a 30 million dollar garage. Okay, so I can spend the majority of the metro district funds creating that parking garage which creates the workforce housing because it's on top on top of that garage and the grocery store and some of the other uses that are that are adjacent to it those other uses are not necessary to the funding of that 34 million that i'm using because it's not part of that 75% in this very conservatively underwritten building that i know about right so but they do add more to the project fund which is why we said 68 is how much we anticipate we might get up to some other number because when I bring the grocery store in, that's a big sales tax revenue thing, but it's not inside the underwriting for the money that we need to do the works that we're talking about. Okay, so the laundry list of the work is not, it's not I didn't identify it. <laughs> the town gave me a list and said, we have a roundabout, we have water treatment, we have these things. And we said infrastructure. And we said, you know, where are we gonna get the most bang for our buck utilizing those funds? And the biggest demand th that everybody talks about is workforce housing. So of course, that's one of my priorities is how do I spend the 34 that I'm ho hoping I achieve through the PUD to create more additional 
workforce housing, and if I can also increase sales tax and other uses adjoining that project, it means we'll have even more money to do those other uh, public works. Yeah, you would also, one last question, you also mentioned that you, you can't wait forever, you're a developer, you have to go where you know, projects are being approved, et cetera, understood time is money. Yeah. So we have two options, Mayor, in front of us, right? And, and it's unusual just the way it's been set up. So I believe I'm correct in saying if this council approves the previous approval, then this would go to the referendum theoretically October 1st. The public vote, correct. Right. And that's three months away. Correct. So and what does that mean for theoretically for your project, if that's the case? I mean, it, it, it all that, and that's a three month delay we can live with. I mean, because we 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 have to understand at this point, it's going to be difficult for us to do any other work other than demolition this year. So, you know, we we're probably next year in terms of vertical construction. And so, you know, it's so the idea that if if in October one, the public saw fit to allow us to move forward because they saw the same thing I'm describing, then um, likely this year, all that we'd see is some uh, dem demolition work. I'm sorry, uh, one more point. So the editorial point, you indicated earlier that uh, the anxiety in, in, within Dylan, you know, about the, mm -hmm. the project, et cetera, has helped you narrow the scope and, and really figure out what's important to the community, the lakeside views, et cetera. So I imagine if this group does in fact approve the previous approval that you will have ample opportunity <laughs> to engage the citizenry of, of Dylan and make your project theoretically more appealing to to the citizens yeah i won't speak for the petitioners but i i have been speaking to one of the petitioners in particular and um you know we've committed to having more town halls like we've had to have more interface in because there's a pud that's that is um approved and and at that point i know exactly what my guardrails are and i can have a more effective conversation about Hey, you don't like this color. You don't like this. You you'd prefer a smaller pool, and those are the kinds of things I can work through um, during because during that process. Now I'm still stuck with A or B, <laughs> so it, but but in terms of the PUD itself, but in terms of what we build, I have more flexibility to have that meaningful conversation. Anyone else have questions or would like to share where they're leaning? So we know. May, may I? Um, when I was, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> when I was 10, 10 years old, I was keen about Monopoly, the game of Monopoly. And for some reason, I see this whole thing as Dylan is the Monopoly board. And um, there's a lot of talk going on. But as Carolyn, our mayor, pointed out, no, these things are not in writing. And um, when we played Monopoly, we had to save up our paper dollars and we had to buy the property. It shows commitment. And then we could put on our houses and our hotels. But in this game, the properties are not owned at this time. So we have a little problem. We're talking about intangibles. We're talking about smoke and mirrors. We're talking about things that have not been pinned down. And one of the reasons why so many of us as homeowners, people that raise their kids here, people that um, are love their town, is not to oppose development. Dylan obviously needs revitalization. We all want that. But this plan is hasty. It came together with no traffic study. It came together with no workforce housing. And as much as we talk about that, it's still not in writing. The contract, the PUD. So we're saying, let us review this and let us go back and do an excellent job of vetting the PUD and vetting the developer. Um, I'm worried about the metro districts. Um, no, no agency in Colorado, no government, county, um, municipality, anything oversees the metro districts. There is no oversight. And the only people that are really bringing this to the fore is the Denver Post. Um, 
and this is a compilation of headlines, and it's 40 articles, and some of them are totally in-depth. They're like a master's thesis. Or, it, they are so well-researched, and they are so excellent. And so I think we need to go into this with our eyes wide open and not swept away by promises that can evaporate. So I would like very much to um, have us revamp the plan, have us go through it meticulously and make it right and good, the part that's in writing, and make it to satisfy the desires of the people who elected our town council. And by the way, thank you for your service. We appreciate it. This is going on pretty long and I know that you guys put in that time. So we're very thankful for that. What I wanted to say is that um, the Metro District, and I think you heard a review of this, has no oversight. It has the authority to issue tax-free bonds. And these bonds are senior bonds and junior bonds. The senior bonds usually sell in Colorado many of the developers buy the junior bonds and they hold on to them. The interest rates when they are, um, when the interest is deferred or even when it's taken, the interest rates run as high as 39.46%. I am worried about those people that buy into the beautiful branded residences. Can they support all this infrastructure what about Uptown 240? Can they support that? I mean, we're tying everything to Boardwalk and Park Place. And I don't think that it has the capacity to take on the multiplied millions of dollars of investment. So today, I would just like to point out that um, these tax-free bonds are a boon for Colorado developers. They, um, they can put business partners on their board they have absolute free reign, and we don't know what's coming. We just don't know. So what I'm saying is, let us go back to the drawing boards. Let us keep the good parts of this plan. Let us solidify the, the things that people are asking for, such as workforce housing. Let's tie it down and get it in, and let, let it be signed, sealed, and delivered. So we, we have a lot of promises, a lot of talk. But when it comes right down to it, I think Caroline is right. It's not in writing. And so what we have is ephemeral. It's um, intangible. And it's, um, it could go any way. So thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mary Ellen. So for those who were confused about why are we allowing a public hearing or a public comment at this stage, um, I felt that it was appropriate because Mary Ellen was the author of the referendum petition. So she was here speaking on behalf of the petition that we are, that brought us to where we are today. So just in, in quick in response to that. So the, the, the Metro District, again, for the explanation of what the Metro, how it functions and, and the way we set it up is that all it is is a bucket and it catches taxes that we are taxing against our own project. Okay, so we have a project, we set up a series of taxes, we're gonna collect those taxes and put it into a bucket. How that gets deployed ultimately will rest in this town. So I, like I will come to you and say, how do you feel about a par public parking deck in workforce housing? And you'll say yes or no to it. And then I'll say, well, the bucket's just sitting there. Let me try another use in another location, um, a municipal building. Now, so the point of the master plan, I called it, and I probably could have chosen a different term of art, but the, the point of laying out potential execution strategy is to say that here are options for ways to spend some of that money. Um, where I think there's public good that can come of it. There could be... in. If we, for example, in the exchange of moving the town hall to another site, it frees up one of the largest parcels in town to be utilized for workforce housing. You know, so it doesn't have to be workforce housing down 
at, you know, these are options. They're not some, I don't, I don't get to make the plan. I just tell you ideas and you guys tell me what makes sense to execute, but we can't do any of it without the budget to do it. And so, you know, and we've spent, everybody invested a lot of energy to create the tool that it's, it's a tool that we then have in our quiver to be able to utilize, to make those improvements. If you guys direct us to do so. The Metro District, it's this Metro District, unlike a district like Santa Lake, which is just a residential subdivision where the infrastructure goes in and the lots are made. This is more so because because of the commercial nature of the intended project, the amount of revenue can, can get more significant. And that means that the amount of public work can get more significant. I, I, one of the things that should be very plain on the face of a Metro District is that the money is only useful if you guys approve a project and that money is only useful to the public, it cannot by law benefit me. Okay. By law, the funds that are inside the Metro district are not allowed to benefit me as the developer. It, what they do is they prevent, they provide opportunity for adjacent development, which would benefit me. It would benefit everybody. I would hope that an adjacent project, because I bring a trunk line for the sewer line, I pay for that with the Metro funds. Now anybody who wants to develop in town has access to a brand new trunk line, including me, you know, so it's a, it's not intended as a vehicle for me to make money. I'm exclusively excluded from making money pursuant to the Metro district. So it's, it is a, only a public tool for financing. The, um, you know, the, I, I think that in terms of, again, getting back to the comments about how do we rework this, if you were to vote tonight to turn down and rescind the PUD, then I, uh, the only program that I have left is the project of me buying the parcel, which we're going to do, and creating an as of right project. Those are, that's, so it, it's not that we can infinitely redesign the concept on this one project. It's it's an A or B type of selection. And, you know, so in most parties that I've spoken to, like the building as it's designed that was approved through the PUD, better than a single uh, bar of condos like you see down all the way down the street on Lodgepole. All that type of product is what would end up on that waterfront. 20 feet from each side of the lot lines, straight up and down for 43 feet. So that's, that is, and I think that that would be a major lost opportunity. And every time somebody drives down Lake Dillon Drive, they say, why does this what happened? <laughs> why did we end up with this as the best we could do in town? Council, does anyone else want to share their comments or suggest where they're leaning to? John, do you have any comments you want to share? Sure, I guess I'll go. Um, so, so Jake, you know this, or everybody else too, a lot of the referendum people think that by voting no, then they're hoping that you're gonna go away, mm -hmm. first of all. And then as we just heard, they think that we're gonna reopen and start negotiating again. So I, I believe, I, I'm listening to what everyone's saying, that there's two choices. And so um, I think both of those choices would meet my goal of revitalizing the core. When I joined the council, people told me that they wanted to revitalize the core so that it's no longer the ghost town that was described earlier. And I think either building is gonna bring in people with money in their pockets that will allow businesses to thrive here. So if I believe that, then my next step is which building is better. And I have to say that the building that we worked really hard over a year and a half to mold and shape is the better of the two. I wasn't originally in favor of this. The When the proposal first came out, the revenue share wasn't good for, for Dylan. The mill rate levy was too high for Dylan. And I would have said no way back then. But all that has changed to the point where I think that we have a great product and I'm excited for the future of Dylan. So I'm not, I know there's people that are totally opposed to this and they'll be mad at me, but I'm, don't be mad at me because you're gonna get to decide. 
So I'm going to vote to like I did the first time, which will push push all this into the voters, make allow the voters to decide. And you guys will all decide. That's my position. Thanks, John. Um, anybody else? I don't have notes down for specific thoughts shared by Oliver, Rachel, Kyle, or Renee. Are you leaning towards one option or another? Um, I am leaning to Thank you all for oh, coming, by the way. And um, yeah, there's a lot of emotion here. I, I get it. Um, I, change is hard. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so I um, the decision by the council, the original decision preceded me. However, as a D Dillon citizen, I have been following along with this project, um, you know, for the last couple of years, as long as you guys have been considering it. So been very educated about it. And um, um, yeah, it was um, so I'm I'm leaning more towards upholding the original decision by the council. And referring it to the voters. Yes. Anyone else? Um, I'll go. I, I am also um, in favor of a resolution 3324 series of 24 upholding our decision from before. Um, and yeah, that's really all I have to say. I've stated a lot of comments before and I don't think I need to repeat it. I think it's a great it's a great opportunity for the town of Dillon. It's going to bring sales tax to us. It's it, it the PUD cannot have affordable housing in this petite PUD. That's why he had said no regarding workforce housing. But he has come forward really for the whole two years that he's been t discussing this development um, with the Best Western area. He's been talking about affordable housing because you have to have employees work at these uh, the restaurants and the retail and the <clears throat> The type of development that he's doing. So it, I, you know, there is going to be employee housing, and he's been showing that on other various conceptual conception meetings that we've had. So anyway, I'm just going to say I'm in favor of going forward with letting you guys all vote. If there is a grocery store that ends up in the metro district, will it be taxed at a? I mean, it's going to be unaffordable for the people of Dillon to shop at as a reasonable option to buy their regular groceries. There's no PIF. That would be an additional tax on the grocery store. Um, there's also rules against taxes that are applied to food and beverage. So, you know, I I I would defer to um, bond or the uh, attorneys who are involved in the taxation components for that for exactly what the series of taxes would be. But I know that there's. Um, for groceries specifically, typically it's it's the, it's those things that sales tax would apply to. It's the same sales tax, and we it's just that there's a certain amount of that tax as negotiated between us that would split between the town and us. So it's not additional tax sales tax. It's the sales tax that was there would be split. I just don't know what that tax is. I don't. Mm -hmm. Kyle or Oliver, did you want to share any thoughts? Sure. Um, I'm so irritated. Um, you all are talking like this has been in front of us for a long time. Like uh, what you approved, what we approved at the last go around, that it's been in front, in front of us for a long time, and it hasn't. It came up. He presented it, and you're like, oh, yeah, that looks great. Let's go for it. No talk about, you didn't want to talk about workforce housing. You didn't want to talk about all of the units being short-term rentals. That's going to be a turnover. I mean, say it's a, a week rental. 200 families turning over every week, almost year-round. This whole county has been trying to work on a a solution for cutting back or cutting down on short-term rentals. And here we are, we're gonna just jump right in and approve 200 more. I mean, 
we didn't even discuss it. You just said, yeah, let's do it. So I hope this time around, when it goes to the people and the new proposals that Jake comes up with, I hope you're willing to put that back on the table and at least talk about it. Talk about maybe long-term housing, workforce or not. Workforce can still be on the north side of the building. It could still happen. But we need to talk about the things that are important, not just going for it. So my original vote will stand. I would vote to approve the previous council decision for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, the folks who own the Best Western, I, I forget the name of the couple, clearly want to sell. And that's our right, your right in, in this country to be able to sell, sell uh, the property. It's a beautiful piece of property and I think it needs a first class building function, right, to help bring people in town and support the sales tax. Uh, number two, uh, the developer has spent a lot of time with city staff to look at the variances, et cetera, and, and design the building. We all have our preferences in terms of what our homes may look like, what color we prefer, et cetera. Uh, but uh, staff approved based on the code. And uh, that, that I think is a, is a very important step. We, we, shouldn't sort of question uh, that in, in my estimation. Uh, if I understand it correctly, and I'm again, I'm a newbie along with Rachel, uh, the Metro district is already set up. Is that correct? I mean, the count, council voted back in 23 to set up the Metro district. So you know, uh, that's, that's there. It's live and well, and there's a board meeting, I think in November of this year. Uh, so that, you know, that, that, that ship has sailed. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity um, for if, if in fact, council uh, approves the previous approval. I think there's an opportunity for you to sharpen your pen, sharpen your pencil as well, and accept input from from the community as you've been trying to do, and it's difficult. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's never wrong to go to the people with with the question of the, does the do the voters of Dillon want this? I don't see Dillon as a vacation destination. And that's what it'll be with that building. Um, I'll share some comments and I'll try to keep them organized, but admittedly my notes are disorganized. I'll start with a quote that you said the will of the town council. You were trying to suss out the will of the town council. And the way I understand the role, the will of the town council is the will of the people. We are representatives of the people. And so for me, sort of every step we've taken here has been a little backward. If we're trying to get to an approval so that you can ask the people if they like it, that's back. Um, and I, I agree with what Council Member Hendricks just said. They, and you noted it from your public meeting that you did hold. There was a sense of frustration from the group. Um, and I've heard a bunch of people here say, we've been working on this for a couple of years. I don't agree with that. And every time anyone from the public has asked me, I've said, well, I expect to see an application that I can talk to you about. But up to this point in executive session, we've been asked one specific question or one specific question over here. And we've never had a thorough discussion about it. Everything has been, as Mary Ellen said, sort of smoke and mirrors. And we get something at the last second and it has to be approved tonight or, uh, or the whole project's dead. And that's how it's felt for me. So there's been a real disconnect from, uh, and I hear that from the people and I feel it myself as far as have we had substantial input on this? I don't think we have. Have the people had an opportunity to be heard in a way that their in input can be incorporated into the project? 
I don't think they have. And I think the referendum and and I noted the same thing that uh, Chris Richard pointed out. 205 people signed the thing. 205 people have never voted an election in Dillon. So, so to see that kind of turnout is astounding. And, and, and we should all be listening to that. And so where that takes me, well, one more note. <laughs> Way back at the beginning, the first thing we ever saw included the town hall site. And at that time, we specifically said to you, this is not an option. We have a million mortgages on this thing. We're never getting out from under it and, and take it off the table. And yet here it is again, it popped up again last week. And we specifically told you this site is not an option. And so for you to say that you've been working with us and listening to us, I push back against that a little bit because I don't think that's what's been happening. I think it's sort of, for me, felt like it's been your way or the highway. And to me, it's felt like you went in big so that so that when we narrow it down from this outrageous plan to something that's going to still produce an outrageous amount of money for you, it seems more acceptable than what the initial thing is. And that's how it feels to me. So... <laughs> Another quote you said here, you are exclusively excluded from benefiting from the Metro District. Does that mean you alone, Jake Porritt, you as an individual citizen are excluded from benefiting from the Metro District or you and anyone you're associated with or you and any businesses you may be a part of or is it, is it you as an individual? It's all of the companies that we are, that we as defined in the document, any affiliate can't receive funds from the Metro District. Those are documents that you guys reviewed and, and approved. And, and that was specifically negotiated and described in those documents. That being said, I said this in the initial hearing and I'll say it again now. If you would commit to something specific to the town saying, as a condition of approval, yes, I will build workforce housing instead of just saying it with your voice, but write it down on paper so that everyone can reference it and hold you to it, then I think that would go a long way for the people. But we're beyond that point. And so I voted against every single stage of this, the Metro District, everything, every single part of it, I voted no. And um, it grieves me a little here that I will have to vote yes, to option two here so that the people can tell us what they want. And I think you're right that it gives them, and I hope by referring this item to the public, that it, that it gives them the opportunity you've promised here tonight, that they will have a platform to give feedback and to see changes substantially recorded so that when they vote on it, it's not a promise they're voting on. It's it's actual facts. And whether that's you submitting a PUD for workforce housing or you doing something actionable and approvable that the people can say, okay, he's committed to this. And 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 not just, you know, and at this point, I need real reassurances, like not just we gave you approval to to build workforce housing, but as a condition that, I don't know, you have to start it before the other one, or you have to get on the horse and show us, put your money where your mouth is and show us what you're going to do for the town before you benefit and walk out of town without anything holding you back. I'm not saying you're going to do that, but I'm saying that's a real fear of the people and you should know exactly why, because you purchased it. We've, we've already seen a developer try to build something and leave town. And we're not interested in seeing it again. That's what I hear from the people. And so I need action. And I think the people need to see something from you. So this will be the first time that I will vote in favor of this project only because it sends it to a vote of the people. So I would entertain a motion to approve resolution number 3334 series of 2024. Just so you know. Um, Even if you vote 
no, it still goes to the people. I know, and I might. All right, I'll make a motion for the consideration of resolution number 3324. We have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 3324, series of 2024, resolution referring an ordinance to a vote of the registered electors of the town of Dillon at a special election to be held October 1, 2024, directing the town clerk to fix the ballot title and taking other actions with respect to said election. Any further discussion? Roll call. Councilman? Yes. Councilman? Yes. 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 Councilmember Edwards? No. Councilmember Christensen? Yes. Madam Severa? Yes. So there will be an election held October 1, referring this issue to the voters. Up next, consideration of resolution number 3224, series of 2024, a resolution by the town council of the D town of Dillon, Colorado, making supplemental appropriations to various funds for the town of Dillon, Colorado for the 2024 budget year. The time is 917 and the public hearing is open. Dave. Okay. Um, so resolution number 32-24 is, um, is presented to the council to amend the 2024 budget for the following supplemental appropriations. And we have a total supplemental appropriation to the general fund for $46,995. And that is for the a new Engage Dillon website and a new paychecks, payroll, and HR software. And we also have a total supplemental appropriation to the capital fund for $50,219 for body cameras for the police department and e-citations, which are essentially digital tickets. And we have a total supplemental appropriation to the marina fund for $50,000 for a pump out barge. And finally, we have a total supplemental appropriation to the Housing 5A Fund for $1,341,059, uh, the majority of which was already approved by Council for the purchase of 201 East Anem Anemone Units A and B for 1.2. If you don't mind. Oh, sorry. Would you please take your conversation outside? Sorry about okay. that. Okay. No, thank you. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, um, we are presenting this resolution 32-24 for council's um, vote and or approval or not <laughs> for the 24 um, approach, 2024 budget appropriations. Any questions for Mary Kay about the supplemental appropriations? Nope, we've already discussed them and um, the last and I'm okay with it. No, I don't have any questions. Yep. I would entertain a motion to approve. Resolution number 3224, series of 2024. Second. Is there any further discussion? Roll call. Yes. Council Member Yes. Council Member Time? Yes. Council Member Yes. Council Member Christensen? Yes. Council Member Hendricks? Yes. Yes. Thank you, MK. Thank you. Up next, review of the future council agendas. Anybody have anything? You'd like to see on there. I, I would. I mentioned this, I think, a couple of meetings ago, but the, the, the presentation from the summit combined housing authority. Sure. That'd be good. I'd like Great. to see that too. Yeah. Well, I mean, whenever is available. I think that's very pertinent and yeah. can probably link it into our next inclusionary housing discussion. Exactly. I also, I, I guess, we need to push out the code of conduct because if council members are going to keep going rogue to do their own research and take on the jobs of town staff or council, then I think we need to figure out what we're doing here. Revisiting the code of conduct. Yeah. What's appropriate for council well, members to be doing. Yeah. I think that includes everyone on this council. Right. Just, right. Yeah, including the, the mayor. Right. Well, I am yeah. part of the council. That's right. We will do that. Also including you. Including me, yeah, everywhere. I'm the one that's been <laughs> wanting to bring it back. Also including you. 
Um, I don't think we understand how we all behave sometimes. And I, I think that we do need to have someone go over everything. The videos are certainly available. Yeah, I watch them. Anything else for the future agendas list? Uh, I have nothing for the mayor's update other than we are, well, we'll be at the next meeting before our next mayor's manager. So I'll ask you then. Council member comments? Mm -hmm. Next, I move to go into executive session pursuant to sections 34A1 of the Town of Dillon Home Rule Charter and CRS 2464024E for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategy for negotiations, and instructing negotiators specifically regarding terms of agreement, agreements pertaining to Uptown 240. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Yes. 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 Yes.